Hi, everybody. Good evening. Buenas noches. My name is Liz Fernandez. I am the job fair administrator, and I appreciate you all joining us this evening, whether you are live or you're watching this at any time. Uh, we are really excited to have this conversation with colleagues from independent schools um, who are friends and who have um, lots of wisdom and stories to share. In just a moment, they will introduce themselves and we'll be having a conversation and asking them some questions. You will note that we host two of these webinars specifically on answering the question, what's it like to be you as a person of color in an independent school? Because no two experiences are exactly alike. And we wanna make sure that we provide you with a range um, of stories and access to experiences that, that different educators of color are having within independent schools. So that is the reason why we offer two, one at the beginning, one at the end. Um, there's always some overlap and there's always something new and nuanced uh, in, in the experience that our panelists share. Um, so uh, I just wanna remind everybody Saturday, this Saturday, February 26th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. is the job fair. If you have not registered, please register as soon as possible. I just know that schools are reviewing candidate materials right now. And so we don't want you to delay any longer. Please make sure that you complete your registration, which will take you five minutes um, at most. Anyway, with that, uh, I wanna welcome in my friends and colleagues um, into the space. I'm gonna ask uh, Rishi, then uh, Willie, then Nelson, then Sakai to introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about um, your experience. Um, where do you work? What's your role? How long have you been there? What kind of school do you work in? Um, and if you have any additional roles uh, within schools or you've held other roles, let our audience know the range of your experiences. So with that, welcome everybody. And here we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Liz. As Liz said, my name is Rishi Alma Bueno. I am the middle school director at Oakwood Friends School in Poughkeepsie, New York. We are a small independent school that is a Quaker school, um, which by the way, is not a prerequisite to work here or to send your children here. Um, so what drew me to this role um, was that I appreciated the values um, that the school is led by, which are Quaker values, which just made sense to me. They, they you know, it wasn't anything that felt super religious or felt like I was working at a, diff a variation of a Catholic school. Um, it, it definitely felt comfortable. Um, I am an expat. So I came from, I'm from the Bronx and that's still in my blood. My husband's from the Bronx. We're in the Bronx like multiple times a month. Um, and we moved up here um, because the school I was in in Harlem, which was also a small independent school, closed. And um, so I was looking for opportunities. I had known about the job fair to promote diversity um, for a few years. I had been hired through the job fair to promote diversity. So it is an amazing asset and a way to create connections. Um, and they had, uh, they were initiating one in the Hudson Valley. And I thought, well, I need a job. So I might as well, you know, expand my reach and try the one in the city and the one in the Hudson Valley. And this opportunity is what came to me and I believe it was the right opportunity at the time. I did not have formal teacher training when I got into working to, in schools. I was a, I entered schools as a registrar and I really enjoyed the independent school environment because it allowed me to be innovative. It allowed me to do things with students that were creative and met their needs without the hassle of the bureaucracy and the red tape that to me felt like kept students from enjoying their educational experience. So um, I was drawn to that environment. I did not get my first job in independent schools through a job fair. It was through a, a person that I knew. So just remember that connections that you've made are really, really important um, and can get you linked up in, that, in this environment. Um, and I left the independent school environment. I was working in public schools and it just did not feel right. So I came back and that's when the job fair became extremely important to me um, in terms of resources and access and 
exposing me to the many, many schools in the system, um, both in the city and obviously outside of the city. So um, that's a little bit about me. This is my fourth year at Oakwood. I am the middle school director and um, it is my 14th or 15th year in education. So um, oh, that feels like a, I'm getting in double digits. So that feels like a little dated, but I'm still 21 forever. So, um, so I'm happy to answer any questions and, and share with you anything that you guys are wondering. Excellent, thank you so much. I love the introductions because um, a part of our journey is about telling stories. And it's really a great thing to hear the stories of individuals that we may think we know, but it's really the story that provides the bridge between where we are and where we aspire to be. So a little bit about my story. My first name is Willie, my last name is Teacher. Yes, I hear it all the time. And I'm an educator here up at the Hackley School. And when I say up at the Hackley School, it's in Westchester. Um, it's a K through 12 school. And we usually have a lot of our components mixed with middle and upper, and we keep the kiddies over on the side to try and just provide um, appropriate age appropriate learning. I am a drama teacher here. I teach drama from fifth grade all the way up to 12th grade. I teach public speaking. I teach and work with the Board of Magistrates on disciplinary actions. I am also part of the um, admissions committee here at the school. I'm one of the officers. And of course, in all the spare time that I have, I'm an upper school diversity coordinator. So one of the things that I remember, Rishi, I love the fact that you talked about your experience in Harlem. My school prior to this, was the theater director for the Harlem School of the Arts on 145th and St. Nick. And when I did get the opportunity to have this job, which was my first in independent schools, the music director for the program was just like, oh, they told you one job on your paper, beware. And I was like, no, I'm just going up there to direct shows. I'm gonna go ahead and show them. Well, if they tell you more than one job, or if you think it's more than one job, I'm guaranteeing you right now, it's more than one job, more than one responsibility but also more than one opportunity to impact and affect the lives of these students. I have um, three children, one who has graduated from here two years ago, a current seventh grader and a current ninth grader. I identify with he, him, his, my first Fourier into independent schools. Prior to this at the Harlem School of the Arts was the director and then did a lot of educational consulting in New York City public schools and in the New York City system and such. And this opportunity came via a, an employee that was working for me and it just was overwhelming for her. And she kindly asked, hey, teach, do you know anyone who might want to take on this responsibility? And I was like, okay, abundant resources, opportunities to make and facilitate change and to impact a completely different audience that I was getting at the Harlem School of the Arts, I'll take it. So I came up here, did my audi audition, did my interview, and got the gig and I've been here nine years. I, I really enjoy it. And I was thinking about um, this with regard to Liz. And I think being at an independent school for me, I'll speak from that eye perspective, is the same thing as being a black man in America. Ebbs, flows, highs, lows, opportunities to speak up, places where you just have to kind of get through it and keep focused on a larger prize. So, um, before I got here, and then I'll pass it off. Before I got here, I thought all independent schools were magic. You just hit the magic wand and the kids were fine. There were no issues, the parents were on board. Um, but then I got, and Rich, you said something about avoiding politics. Politics are abundant in some of these institutions. And it's just where you find your tribe and how you navigate the waters that we've been faced with. But if it's something that you're 100% interested in, please go for it, because we would love to have more like-minded and like-looking folks up in these spaces. So thank you. That was awesome. Um, so hi, my name is Nelson Arroyo. Um, I teach at Riverdale Country School. Um, this is my seventh year as an educator. This is my this is my second year at Riverdale. Um, I'm an English teacher. Um, I work as a, I am working in developing the middle school curriculum for the DEIB department. Um, I also work with the service learning department. Um, I run a couple of clubs, one being change agents, which are students who are um, interested in affecting change within and around the community. 
Um, I also run a club called Cultural Conversations where students come in and share a little bit about their culture and we sort of learn from one another. We share stories, we share food, um, we do different things of that sort. Um, I'm also now, so I'm in my car. I'm, I apologize for the darkness because I just got out of softball practice and um, the power in our school ended up going out. So I'm in my car. So again, I apologize for that, but that's a new role as well that I took on, which is middle school softball. Um, and I say that in the multitude of opportunities I've was echoed before is that you do have the opportunity at an independent school to kind of make it however you want, right? Whether you want to take on responsibilities or you want to kind of sit back for a little bit and just teach and sort of let that sort of guide you. I'm personally someone who is a little bit, um, I like doing things and I like being a part of different things. But I think, especially with independent schools, you have the opportunity to really pick and choose kind of where you want to affect change, where you see yourself, and also surrounding yourself with teams that are going to empower you and also going to make you better. So like I, when I went in, I was told very early on, you know, be careful because, you know, independent schools, especially Riverdale, um, can sort of take their pound of flesh, right? And, and if you are a person of color who has great ideas, they're, you know, they're, people are always going to want to tap in. So I think it's important to realize like what you want to do. So if you do go into independent schools, know what you want out of that experience and sort of go and gravitate towards those people and towards those groups and sort of put your name in the hat of where you want to get involved. Um, I am transitioning from public school. I taught at the Academy for Software Engineering for five years. And in all honesty, I had a tough time leaving um, my public school because, you know, I was a part of that founding graduating class and it's all students who look like me. And I was I, I was torn for a long time, especially last year being my first year in a COVID year where I really didn't feel like I had community. Um, and I'm someone who really strives and loves community and, and loves to connect with different people. So it was tough. I had I had a, a heavy case of like imposter syndrome last year. Right. You're surrounded by people who have. PhDs and all of these things and you kind of you're always sort of matching yourself up against other people but what I am here to tell you is that even though people have those great credentials what I've learned as someone from public school is that um like my training my teacher training sort of gave me a leg up that a lot of these professors didn't have right and and I think and a lot of my experiences helped me to connect to children better than a lot of these sort of PhDs and all of these right really academic minded folks. Um, you you have you have that skill as well, and you have those those same ideas. Um, so I would say make sure not to like sell yourself short on what you're bringing to the table because what you have is valuable, and they want they want that at that school. And again, as was mentioned before, like make your voice heard. Um, speak your opinion, get involved in different things. Um, what else did I want to add? Um, and I think being in an independent school, so Riverdale is a is a K through 12, but we have the K through five, it, what's called the lower school and, and the, by the river. So like they're in a separate sort of offsite nearby. And then I'm in the middle school. And so it goes from six through 12 and we're on the Hill campus. Um, I think what's important, I think what's mentioned before, I think, Willie, you brought this up about finding your tribe. What was super important for me as well, and I'm, I'm so blessed and thankful, is that teachers of color at these independent schools will look out for you. So the first day I got hired and I came on, a woman by the name of Shelby Stokes, who's been there for a long time, hit me up and said, hey, thank you. I'm so glad you joined the team. I'm here to talk whenever you want. So that's another thing as well in independent schools is teachers of color really look out for each other. Um, because they know what the system is like and what it can be if you don't have anyone on your side. So look out for those people, reach out to those people, but also be rest assured that they will also be looking for you and they will look out for you as well. So you will have those people in your corner. That was incredible. Um... You mentioned a group called Change Agents, and I often feel like that's what the title of my job role should be in my school. Uh, um, I am at International School of Brooklyn. I am the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director. Um, that DEI work has um, been all over the news and, and is at the forefront of a lot of conversation right now. It is my first full-time role 
in an independent school, but I'm not new to independent schools. Um, I am a Prep for Prep alum, and I worked at Prep for Prep for a long time. Uh, I come from a college access background. I did college access for 16 years at other community-based organizations in New York City, um, working directly also with public school students and charter school students, and, um, and really didn't think I was gonna work in independent schools because I, not, I had a great experience myself in independent school, but I had a lot of friends that looked like me who didn't. And I also knew the huge disparity between resources and, and just need for more good energy um, and, and dedicated educators uh, elsewhere. Um, but ISB presented itself really different to me. Uh, I was really excited about the opportunity to join what is um, a fairly young independent school. We're 17 years young. We are pre-K through eight. Um, we are a language immersion IB school. So that means that we, uh, we speak to a lot of different parties and we hear, adhere to a lot, of different, um, a lot of different systems in our school, which I think is really beneficial and also can be really limiting. And um, I am six months into this role. I'm, I'm six months into being at ISB. And there are a lot of things that I really enjoy about being here in this place, in this space. And then as you can imagine with DEI work, no matter where you are, there are, are challenges. Um, I think Willie talked about the ebbs and flows. And I, I definitely think that right now I'm in a stride and you know, I, I, I expect for there to be some sort of ebb um, <laughs> in the near future. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really incredible space to be in. I, again, I really enjoyed my time as a student in independent schools, um, but I think much like Willie, I, I thought about the opportunity to really be back in the space and be able to harness my own power of my own personal student experience and combine that with my professional experience and be able to come back and say, hey, um, as someone who really loved my experience, I can also uh, very, very matter-of-factly point to you the things that I know need changing um, and, and be really able to speak from a point of, of internal perspective and knowing that, you know, that that's really important. Uh, I also don't think everyone's built for this work. Um, I say that to say, I think these places are, can be really tough to be in. Um, if you are, uh, not ready for the politics, if you are not ready, um, ready to have to explain a lot, um, explain a lot about who you are, explain a lot about where you're from, um, explain a lot about, uh, in my case, why your role is important in the building. Um, and not necessarily because people don't believe in it, but because people don't understand it. And I think those are two different things. Um, but I will echo what everyone has said about independent schools being a tremendous opportunity. I have a two-year-old daughter who I fully intend on enrolling in independent school. Um, and that is because I can say firsthand that my educational experience in independent school is what made, you know, what really made me who I am today. So um, given that, I think that there are far more benefits than, um, than challenges and that it is worth it. And as we continue to grow and build these spaces and make them more inclusive and make them more diverse, I think that those benefits will continue to outweigh everything else. And we'll see that gap really, um, really grow smaller and smaller. And so for those of you who are really interested in being in these spaces, I, I really encourage you to do so because um, we need you. You know, I could pontificate about all of the other reasons, but but the 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 the, the first and foremost one is we need you, and and um and you're here now, which means that you're you're already passionate about this work, and so 
Um, we'd love to have you in any of these spaces. Rishi, Willie, Nelson, Sakai, we could just end right now because the amount of wisdom just in your stories and in your introductions that you've shared um, has been an incredible gift to everyone. So very, very clear the level of authenticity that each of you carries in who you are each and every day and in um, the ways in which you center and support young people. Uh, so I just need to acknowledge that, um, you know, just at this moment, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. I, I know that you've talked about how you ended up in independent schools and, you know, some of the, some of the moments that you've had to sort of reconcile, um, either from previous positions or, you know, recognizing there's work to be done everywhere. We know that as, you know, we know that for sure. Um, I would love for you to reflect on, and I'm sure, I hope that you have many, many professional highlights in your time um, at the school. So go through the, you know, the Rolodex of all the memories. Um, and uh, if you could identify, you know, a professional highlight that you have had as a result of being in these schools, um, that professional highlight could be um, with students, it could be with parents, it could be with, with colleagues, it could be in the classroom, at an assembly, in a program, whatever it is, I'm leaving it open just for you all to, to recognize. Um, and uh, I reckon, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Willie for you to go first, Sakai second, Rishi third, and, and I'm fairly certain that Nelson is parking and so he will join us fourth. So, we're good. Awesome, thank you, Liz. Um, first, I am a drama teacher. I connect and I help students find, um, and it's also a convenient excuse in the DEI work that I have to do because I'm helping you find how to play the character. And in order to do that, we're studying characters. We're studying our well-being. We're studying. So if I'm going down a path and a, an administrator or something, we're recording, so I'll say it, whatever. An administrator or something comes to the door. I'm like, we're studying character. We're studying character. Don't get all up and worried about what you hear. Put it in context and know that we're talking about a play. But to answer your question, Liz, there were um, there are there are opportunities that come my way as a drama teacher and as a director for the plays here that I get to expand the students' knowledge of the world and of each other. Um, I was talking to them a few years ago about Kanye and they were just explaining to me what they thought Kanye was now. And I was trying to explain to them that a few years back, Kanye stood up at a um, fundraiser and said, George Bush doesn't care about black people. And the students didn't understand that Kanye because from there we took him down the path of Katrina. And unfortunately at that particular moment, our students weren't familiar with the disparate treatment that students inside the bowl and New Orleans residents received as a product of living in that area and how they're often overlooked, how there are discrepancies and have always been discrepancies that flood them out and get rid of them. So we were able to do a play called the Katrina plays, which were firsthand, um, firsthand interviews conducted by um, a university in the area and by high school and then put into a performative form. And then we were able to take it all the way through up to the point of and including having a New Orleans band come through and provide processionals and marches inside of our space. It was wonderful. And from that, I was like, okay, I think we got something. And then there's this other play that um, maybe you heard of, Much Ado About Nothing. And um, we decided, or I decided, hey, we're onto something. And I was able to set that play inside of the Stonewall Inn and discuss what took place when um, individuals down there had enough of the police and the uh, mistreatment that they were receiving and decided to be in terms of East Coast, one of the uprisings to promote and be advocates for the LB, well, at that point it was the gay rights movement, but the LBGTQIA whole movement in there. And um, there's another play that I get to study that I have to walk very carefully with, but I enjoy it. It's called Day of Absence by Douglas Turner Ward. And it is a small hamlet in the South somewhere. It's a satire. And students, uh, the residents of the play wake up 
and all of the inhabitants who are of African or African-American descent are gone, they vanish, they disappear. And we go through the whole play from a satirical perspective and we study things like Tom's, Coons, Bucks, Baladas, and Mammies and see those tropes and allow the students to understand why they show up in other spaces. And hopefully this group of predominantly white students will be able to go into the world and be facilitators and actuators of change from the knowledge that they picked up. So when you talk about high points for, um, for what I get to do here, uh, Nina Simone charged actors, I'm um, sorry, Nina Simone charged artists with having the responsibility of telling the story, of telling the story and making sure that they are purveyors of history. And I think that every time, COVID's been a little rough in terms of plays and how we can do that. But every time I get to step under the umbrella of studying character, dramaturgical work, the historical background associated with I think I have an opportunity and I'm blessed to learn from and to give to the students so that we can all come closer together to understand how art reflects life and how life reflects art and pieces that might have been missing. We get to, to show them in a different light. And so if I had to point out a high point, that would be one of them. There are a lot, but I really enjoy the opportunity to present those plays or any other play with a particular spin on it. Thanks for letting me share. That's incredible. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, not a professional highlight, but my student highlight from, and I went, I went to Nightingale Bamford, um, which I, for six years, loved it. But my student highlight was, um, they brought in an, an English department head who was an openly gay white man who started a Harlem Renaissance elective. And this was like unprecedented for the time. And it was seven of us girls, uh, only two of us black in the class reading Richard Wright's Black Boy. And we came in after the scene, the, the infamous scene in the book, we come into class and one of my classmates is in tears. And, um, and she said, I, I, it sounds really stupid, but I never knew, I never knew that it was this bad. And my teacher, very matter of factly, said it still is. Didn't, and it was just the most powerful moment where as a student of color in one of these spaces, I felt so validated. And I feel like the work that you're doing is really validating. And so that's, that's really incredible. Um, at ISB, we participated this year in our first Black Lives Matter in School Action Week. Um, it's something that hadn't been done there before. I don't think anyone even had considered it. And Ashley at Churchill School, another incredible institution, she looped us in and it was definitely something that I think there were some people who were wondering how it would be received. I think sometimes we don't give students enough credit, um, especially young children. And that's what I'm learning transitioning from working with high schoolers to pre-K through eight is that um, people often discuss things that they deem age appropriate. Um, these kids taught me more than I taught them. <laughs> so um, I actually had a second grader come up to me and explain to me the hoodie revolution and Trayvon Martin. Um, in the middle of a read aloud I was doing with a book about the Million Man March, um, my, my students created protest signs about everything from equal pay to, um, to Black Lives Matter to um, to, to women's rights. And it was, it was the most incredible moment because it was validating in, um, in my feeling that we need to continue to put information, primary source documents, and if not primary source documents, experiences, and if not experiences, current events, and um, to continue to give children the tools to process the things that they are already hearing about whether you want to reckon with it or not, um, it, it, whether it's their personal experience or not. And when I say personal, I mean lived in, right? Like lived in the skin of a person of color, right? But lived in the skin of um, a persecuted religion, lived in the skin of someone who's from a low socioeconomic status. It, um, they are 
they are still they're still um, expo exposed to these things and and often more often than not they have questions and want answers they don't they don't want to be censored in that way they don't want their learning to be censored and so it was incredible and and really honestly led to discussions about having more programming like this having more funding for programming like this building out my dei team and um for that that that's been a highlight for me um, thanks akai that was really i loved hearing that um I have so much to say. I don't know how to truncate it, but um, Oakwood is a is a boarding school, so that's something to note. Um, I never imagined myself. First of all, let's be honest: in the Hudson Valley and Poughkeepsie, outside of the city, that's that's just like a real statement. I didn't let alone a boarding school. But there are opportunities within the independent school world that don't just exist within the five boroughs. So um, I urge people to kind of look and see what's out there because what fits you best or what fits your next step best might not look like what you envisioned it to look like because that's what's true for me. Um, in terms of um, important moments or, or impactful moments, I have those moments every day because representation 100% matters. And I am literally the only person of color almost in the school. I mean, my husband started working here, so he makes two. Um, and we have, um, but every other person of color on the campus is a person of color that is, and this is not to knock these positions because this is how I got into independent school, but they are in office positions. And it is not downing that work. That is very important work. Having worked in the office, I know that that is what holds a school up. But I felt like I wanted to be someone that students of color that were going to schools could look to and say, wow, look, she's directing this program. She's an administrator. She's someone that is, I could do that. I don't have to just be, not just be, but I, the only opportunities afforded to me are not, they don't stop at the main office. Um, and so that was really important to me. And so for me, my kind of passion has become being a bridge for parent for families of color and students of color in this educational world. Um, it's not an easy world to navigate. There are a lot of unspoken assumptions that families with access or families with money might know about that students of color or families of color don't necessarily know about. It's also super helpful for those families to see a person of color sitting in my office and be able to access me about, and you know, and they've asked me the real deal, right? And so I can tell them not the scripted version of what the school offers or how it can benefit their child or them, the family, but what it actually looks like. And I can promise them and deliver for them that I will be a person that will support their children. So for me, um, that's been the most um, rewarding thing that I've done. And I think like, and I, to be honest, I, it was literally the school year hadn't even started. Some students had come back to campus and I was sitting in my office and two students of color passed by my office and literally started jumping up and down and screaming. And they were like, and I was like, come, come in. <laughs> and they were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're here. Like they, they had never seen, and they were juniors at the time, they had never seen a person of color in this institution. So it can be a lonely, a lonely experience. I'm not gonna lie about that. I think it is important to have a network, not just in your school, but across independent school. So that's one of the reasons I love events like this because it connects you to people. So, oh yeah, right. We did that panel together that time. Let's stay in touch and, and do those things. Um, but it also uh, helps me be a part of the representation and not just talk about it. Um, and then there's other ways in which I'm able to bring things to light. So we had a history teacher leave mid-year. We had to look for someone. It was winter break. So it was not easy to find someone to start teaching in January. So we had to pick up the slack. And, and so I, myself and, and four other teachers took on a history class. 
I said, well, let's just make it a history, a unit on black history. We'll start it in January. And, and everyone was like, oh, and like nobody had thought about that. And everybody kind of chose their different topics. And I'm teaching the seventh grade about Jim Crow. And I got to talk, I got to show them scenes from Lovecraft's country. I got to talk about Tulsa. I got to, you know, like I got to do all of these things and expose them to things. And something just happened literally yesterday where the students were talking about, you know, they're seventh graders. So they were talking about whatever they're talking about. And one of them came up to me and said, oh, can we do this watermelon eating challenge after the presentations? And I was like, let's go ahead and talk about the connotation of black folks and watermelon. And then I then and they were like, they had no idea. But what's crazy to me is that a lot of students and this is not just independent schools, this is like students that are students in 2022. They don't have the same black history exposure that I had. I mean, we did some cahoots on black history. And I was like, Oh, yeah. Um, it wasn't just the Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, you know, era of stuff. It was, you know, George Washington Carver and you know, things like that. And they were like, how do you know that? And I was like, how don't you know this? Why are you? And this was like eighth graders talking to me. So they had no idea. And so I think, you know, and then the fifth grade teacher told me like, yeah, I asked them about Martin Luther King Jr. Day and like half of them didn't even know who he was, which is crazy. So I think for me, part of the um, joy of it is bringing things to life that require that. I'm not going to lie to you. It's also part of the struggle of it because you're often the only person um, or one of a few that are trying to do that. You might find yourself explaining why that's important. You might be the go-to person to talk about the person of color experience, um, to weigh in on what we should do about this or that. So it does require resolve. It does require you to be resilient, but um, it is very rewarding. And, and I think um, who I get to be to students and how I get to support them. And, and, you know, I have students from the upper school coming to see me too, because they don't necessarily have a person that looks like them in that division. And so I, I feel as though um, just being here and, you know, and I don't have ego in it. It doesn't have to be me. I just want them to have that. And so that's part of the joy of, of what I get to do and bring to this environment. Um, wow, uh, hard to follow all this up. Um, but the one thing I will say, because um, I heard about like, you know, we're talking about wins, but also there's obstacles. And one conversation I had recently, um, I recently had like a tough moment um, with regard to this work with DIB work. Um, and I was speaking to the head of, the DIB department and he had told me that these institutions, you're always gonna have pushback because these institutions weren't built for the work that we're doing. And so I think um, I heard a lot about sort of the pushback you can get, understand that that's going to happen. Like these institutions were not made for the work that we're trying to implement and put in. But again, um, I wanna sort of put that first just to talk about the success. Um, I spoke about how I had a lot of imposter syndrome and sort of a big win that I got that got me out of that sort of rut. I was teaching a class. Um, I think we were talking about representation, why representation matters. And this was Zoom was still in effect. And all of a sudden a parent got on the Zoom and I was like, oh no, right? Like, I'm like, I'm, I'm like what's gonna happen now? So this parent gets on her color and she goes, I just want to say, Mr. Roy, like, you're doing a great job. And I love what you're talking about. And I love what you're telling our kids, like, they need to hear this stuff. And that was just such a, like, she caught me at the right moment, right, to really sort of uplift me and empower me. And I think that's another component of this that's really important is uh, fact, uh, parents of color also are there for you. And they will stand by you and really hold you down and will become like some of your best friends. Like, I'm so close with the you know association of parents of color at the school and it's it's really like one big family so those are that's another group of people that will really be there for you especially early on to champion you because they want more of us there and they really want your voice there and they want your opinion um and in talking about sort of like topics like representation and talking about um things like colorism and talking about like double consciousness with my students um, one thing that I was also encouraged by at Riverdale, and I'm sure this exists in other institutions as well, I went in and I was very honest about 
things I teach about. I told the English department, like, I want to talk about these things. And what they told me was, if you want to do it, make sure you go in, like, full force, right? Like, don't, if you're going to do it, go in, go in with the intention that you're going to go in, you know, with the real, real force and intention with it. And I took that to heart and I did it. And I think what I was really encouraged by, again, it's hard coming from public school and then coming to private school where my assumptions were, you know, a lot of root privilege bias here and you're trying to sort of change that mindset and you're not so sure that they're going to receive it well. But when we were doing projects about representation, it was, you know, these same white students who, who as Rishi stated and others stated, like they weren't aware of these things. So they were so excited. They were like really into the knowledge part, right? And like really into the inquiry and asking questions and really creating tangible projects about creating awareness about these things and really being in the forefront and pushing it. So I think it's also, I think Sakai mentioned about um, age appropriate. Like I think these kids are ready more than we give them credit for. Um, and again, uh, getting in with the sensibility as educators and to sort of know what, how to walk that line. But I think a lot of the parents and the students are ready for this information and they're at these schools for a reason, right? So the schools that you go to, um, you want to also make sure that, you know, their ideals align with your ideals. Like I remember one of the first days, the head of school he came out at our first meeting. He said the words Black Lives Matter, right? This white man, the head of school, I want to start off this meeting by saying this. And I felt like I was at least in a place where I was going to be valued, right? Because I came from a public school and you would think my public school would champion that. My principal was also white, never said those words and was very cautious to like even tow around any time we talked about something that may be sort of, I guess, thought provoking or provocative for that sense. So again, I think, finding your school and, and sort of talking to people. And when you go to those interviews, ask those questions, you want to make sure that they align with your ideals, right? And your values that you're going to come in with and that they'll champion what you bring to the school as opposed to sort of suppressing what you're, what you're talking about. Um, and then I just want to end the story by, I spoke about the cultural conversation and that came about after all this curriculum that I was teaching kids about trying to open their eyes and sort of using student voice and telling them like, you are a part of the change. That was students that came to me and said, Mr. Roy, we want to start this club called Cultural Conversations and we want you to be the head of it because all the stuff you talk about in class, we want you to run this club if you're willing to do that. So again, I think give these kids um, your experiences, speak from that eye perspective. They can handle a lot of these things. And I think with your sensibilities and your knowledge and your insight, like that will carry them so far because as was mentioned before, I was talking to a colleague about how many faculty of color we have in English department specifically. And I was like, oh, I think we have like five. And then I started counting. I was like, oh, we have three. Um, so I think again, our stories are super important and it's important that we bring others along, but our stories are so valuable and so important. And these kids need to hear these stories. Hey, Liz, can I jump in with something that just captured onto Nelson? Oh, sure, please go right ahead. Nelson, I love the fact, so I just want to amplify it if it's okay, because there are applicants who might be coming into our fold. And I think there's a piece of knowledge that you gave them that I'm really hoping that they got it and that they don't let it get by. Ask the questions when you're at that interview or when you're at that table meeting them at the nice days job fair and such, ask that question because Everything I talk about is acting. So what? That's where I am. I don't want an actor on their heels. I want an actor on their toes. And I think if you are an actor or if you are an interviewee on your toes, going forward into these job interviews, going forward to speak to the representatives at the table, going forward to these agencies and such, then I think you are really calling them to the carpet. I love the fact, Nelson, that you said, I showed them who I was. And they have to understand because there are times that individuals will be like checkbox. Let's just get let's just get Willie in here. Let's just get Richie in here. Let's just get Liz in there, and then the fit doesn't work. Then we're there for two point two years or whatever the average time that we stay in these schools is. But if you spend that extra time that I believe I heard you talk about, Nelson, really leaning in during the in the inquiry process, during the interview process, during the follow up process, then you will understand if it's the place that you want to give your energy because they will zap your energy. And it's fine if it's reciprocated when we're both elevating to a higher status, but when you're in a relationship and you feel like you're being drained and you start to go back down the steps and you're like, oh, I should have really asked, 
What are you doing for black people? Like, don't beat around it. Where, where's the last, how many women administrators are on your, like really ask those questions. Cause at that point it's a zero sum game. Yes, you want the job respectfully, but also you want to know that you're being valued. And I just heard some of those pieces come to light when you mentioned it, Nelson. So I just wanted to amplify that as they prepare to go into a, 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 an interview type setting. Yeah, I, I just quick, quickly want to add to that, of course, we all want to add, um, but I'm just going to quickly say that when I started in independent schools, what diversity meant to them was people in same sex relationships. So they were all still white, but they were because they were in same sex relationships, they were ticking the box of diversity. And then, you know, somebody came in and said, you're not diverse. Oh, well, we had this person. And it's like, no, 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 no you're not diverse. And so um, I do think it's important. I always, you know, Liz has heard me say this before, but you have to be interviewing them while they're interviewing you. It, this is your job. This is where you are going to be spending more hours than you spend at home. That's real, right? So um, just, just remember that you have to want to be there just as much as they want you there. Um, but you also, I also want, I like urge everyone to really try to get, ask for what that tour is going to look like, right? Like, don't just parade me around and like have me meet who you think I'm going to meet. Is it possible for me to talk to students? Is it possible for me to talk to other teachers of color? Is it possible for me to, you know, to, to ask those questions that I want to ask? And it doesn't have to be rude or, you know, anything like that. Obviously, you're trying to get a job, but it can be informative to you. And I think that those are things that are really important to remember as you embark on this journey. And finally, just a note that independent schools are not an environment where you have to have a bachelor's doctorate, da, da, da. like you don't have to have those things in order to break into the independent school world. And I think that's a common misconception. So don't feel that you have to like run out and like get all these degrees in order to get an opportunity. And also know that getting in an independent school, it is very much a family. So once you're in there, a, you're applicable in like every independent school, you know, that's out there, but also they consider who they have in the pool first for opportunities for advancement. So those are things to just remember. Um, I, I want to add also, and to be, and to be clear, right, just like you're putting your best foot forward in an interview, the schools do too, right? So you could ask all the right questions and all the things that are important to you and, and you can, um, you know, be very clear and, 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 and intentional about letting them know who you are and what you bring to the table and how you plan to approach the work. And then you could still be two, three months in and be like, wait, this is, this is not what I signed up for. Um, and so just like with anything else, make sure you keep your eyes and ears and open and, and as you, um, as you arrive to these spaces, then begin to really like spread yourself out a little bit and, and, and talk to people who they didn't put in front of you on a panel, um, ask them how their experiences are and start to try to get as much of the lay of land as possible. That's been, I know personally, it's been exceedingly difficult for me to do during COVID with a, a lot of the kind of space restrictions, but I think I'm learning more and more about my school um, as the days go by. And, you know, uh, certainly no place is without, is, is with perfection, but, but they all should have progress. So you should be able to point very, um, very, very specifically to points of progress in these spaces. And, and they're not all created equal um, in terms of culture, in terms of community, in terms of um, uh, what, what they consider to be core values versus what their values really are. And so, um, you know, definitely ask questions, whether it's in this group or outside of this group of people who have existed in these spaces, whether it's educationally or professionally, um, or as a parent uh, or a trustee, if you come across those as well, and, and ask them truly, you know, what kind of students thrive in these spaces? 
You know, is, is this a school for more artistic students? Is this a school for students that are more regimented and, and prefer to really keep their head in the books? Is this a school for students who are competitive in sports? Or is this a school for students, you know, who really rather be more cerebral um, the, the majority of the time? Uh, is this a conversation school? Is this a school that 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 really uh, fosters community across divisions, right? Like those are all things that are really, really important. And and you they like like others have said they should align to what your own personal core values are. Otherwise, you definitely won't be happy. You won't be happy doing the work. So you all have basically just answered about four or five questions. Um, which is great because I really appreciate the free flow and the ways in which you've supported and amplified each other's voices. So I wanna, I, I wanna recognize that. Um, I wanna clarify a couple of things just to avoid confusion. Um, most independent schools attending the job fair do require a bachelor's degree. Um, if they don't require a bachelor's degree, then that is something that it depends on the position and it depends on the school. Um, but to attend this particular job fair virtually, uh, the expectation is that you have a BA or BS, which is why college seniors are more than welcome to attend, assuming that that they will have their completed uh, undergraduate degree by September 1 of this year. Um, I absolutely agree that uh, things like certification are not necessarily expectations or requirement that may or may not change for um, in the elementary or lower divisions, um, and certainly in middle and upper school, um, that tends to, to shift more to, to an undergraduate degree or an area, a content area where you are more um, well-versed in, et cetera. Depending on the positions, Willie talked about, he works with the admissions office. He is a drama teacher. He also does upper school diversity coordinator. Um, Nelson talked about he's coaching. He's also um, you know, classroom teaching and advising a club. Sakai is, is managing multiple elements of, of the school in their first year um, in the role uh, at a smaller school, um, which is you know in and of itself, it's a year to get acclimated and to understand and to understand strategy and policies and systems and who's in what position and how does change actually unfold. And, you know, Rishi, I'm so grateful that you're part of this conversation because I remember when you first started at Oakwood and, and in many ways trying to figure out the who, what, where, when, and how um, and in, in your role. Um, in, in the time that we have left and we have about seven minutes, so I'm gonna ask you all to really, um, in response to this question, really sort of curtail your response is to, to be crisp and say what's core, because um, we have a hard stop at eight. Um, you know, when you think about all that you've shared and how important it is to be able to be, you know, in your full and most authentic self at, at a school, how do you, how have you managed the balance between being that person um, and speaking to your own experiences? Um, and some of the pushback and challenge that, that people say, oh, you know, I feel uncomfortable or I, you know, I feel emotionally unsafe or, um, you know, how are you managing and navigating that? Um, and if, and I, I'd, I'd love for you to answer that question briefly through the lens of, this is advice that you're offering prospective candidates um, who are coming to this event, either for the first time being exposed to independent schools or there might be switching schools or transitioning from a, some other workforce. And I wanna be clear to everybody, there are challenges everywhere in every industry and you know, whether it's higher ed, whether it's nonprofit, the corporate sector, independent schools, there are challenges everywhere. That's what systemic racism is. That's what systemic classism is. That's what systemic sexism is. So let's not fool ourselves in thinking that it's gonna be oh so different in here versus there. So how do you manage, how do you stay authentic while you know, making those authentic connections when, pe when people say that they're uncomfortable um, you know, through the lens of advice and, and 
we've got five minutes. So remember, be crisp, say what's core. I'm going to go to uh, to Nelson, then Rishi, then Sakai and Willie. Uh, you're going to close us out. So there you go. All right, speed round. Um, I think I'm also reminded by a voice in my head that some great piece of advice like when I get pushback is people be people in, um, in that there's always going to be some pushback. And I think that pushback just shows you that that you're doing good work because that means that you are driving up a little uncomfortability, right? And it's making people sort of shift in their seats a little bit, right? They want to push away. So I think that uncomfortability that you get in that pushback, understand that you are actually doing something that is making someone uncomfortable, but it is sort of driving change. And that's where the uncomfortability is coming from. So I would always advise you to, again, be authentic and, and speak from your perspective and your experiences. Um, also, don't be afraid to sort of leverage some of your sort of connections with either other faculty of color or people or administrators to, to sort of be in your corner for those tougher conversations. Um, like I said, I just had kind of a difficult situation arise. And I think what, what's also useful when people offer pushback is a lot of times they don't give suggestions. So I think even sometimes having those conversations and inviting them in and saying, okay, I see, I see your point here. What would you, what would you suggest, right? And having that open dialogue where you kind of also put it in their court to actually give productive solutions as opposed to just someone saying, I'm comfortable, I don't wanna do this and sort of leaving the conversation, inviting that uncomfortability in and saying like, what would you suggest, right? And sort of having that dialogue and conversation so you can also see their perspective, but they can also see yours as well. I fully agree with Nelson, Pre raising present discomfort drives change. It is only when people are uncomfortable that things change. So um, I think it's really important to remember that. I would say um, my advice is to set your boundaries because I think very often people will people will be people in, and they will cross over your boundaries if you don't set them. Um, they can't know what they are if, if you don't say them. Um, but if you do say them and they cross them, it is very important to respectfully let them know this is not something that I'm, I'm going to do, that I'm comfortable doing. Um, I've had to, to say that in my role. I've had to say, I'm not gonna speak for every person of color simply because this was an issue around students of color and you would like me to represent that opinion. Um, and so I, that was respected. And so um, don't, and I would also say be gentle with yourself. Don't look at setting your own boundaries as a, as a bad thing or as a way that you're holding yourself back from the school, look at it as a way of you're protecting yourself um, and making sure that you can get through, um, but also that people can understand that, you know, you're, you're a person, you have lines, and you want to make sure that people understand what those things are. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Uh, never in our ancestors' wildest dreams would they have ever imagined us being in these spaces. We, be we belong in these spaces. These spaces want us here. Um, and don't let others' discomfort qualify your purpose in being in these spaces, right? Um, you have a story that needs to be told. You have work that needs to be done. Keep doing it. Um, there are more people who want you doing this work than there are people who do not want you doing this work. And so tap into those, uh, create allies and alliances. It's like chess. Um, and, and to press forward. Um, there's, there's a lot of resources to be had to do good work. And so gr grasp them and, and do it. Love it. Um, Liz, I think everything was said, but we all talk about top five. So I got my top five list, Biggie, Nas, Jay-Z, Black Thought, you know, that regular, but you need a top five here. So I'm gonna give you five. We are an oil tanker, not a speedboat. This thing moves slow. Understand that going in. Two, um, when I'm teaching acting, I explore all the beats, but when I'm performing, you just show a few of the beats. You don't have to give them everything that you did, but you should be aware of them. Three, you said it, and I'm gonna say it again, boundaries, super important from the very beginning. I was legitimately trained over here that my boss does not answer her phone on weekends, and I was fired up about it. And I was like, you know what? She ain't gonna answer it. And I figured out the solution to my issues at that time. That's just one example, but find your boundaries. You are not the representative for everybody. That's three. Four, invite other voices to the solution. It's not yours to solve. 
It's yours to perhaps lead the conversation, be a committee chair, be a catalyst for it, but you are not the person to solve all the problems. And then my final top five, find your tribe, both off and on campus. You got to have that. Oh, I put Tribe Called Quest in the five too. Okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> um, I just want to thank all of you. I mean, Rishi, Sakai, Willie, and, and Nelson, you, all, you have, have just dropped some incredible knowledge. I want to reiterate to everybody, Saturday is the job fair. If you have not registered, please register. Please help us spread the word. This event happens once a year. It is free for candidates. We have over 100 schools in the Northeast, and I, I want to remind everybody um, you never know where the opportunity is going to be most exceptional for you. Rishi really spoke to that. Never in a million years did, did Rishi or her family expect that they would be in the Hudson Valley. And yet four years later, you know, that's where they are. And we have schools from Long Island, um, throughout New York, uh, Westchester, the Albany District, Buffalo, Rochester, and then points outside of New York in New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, uh, and Rhode Island. So explore the possibilities, explore the opportunities, and, and hopefully um, you will ultimately end up um, making the kind of difference and impact that you want to make in the lives of young people. So with that, I say thank you to everybody who's joined live. Thank you to my colleague and friend, Andrew from NYSEs for your behind the scenes support. Again, thank you to our panelists and everyone who's watching. We will see you on Saturday, dressed and ready to impress virtually um, and land the next opportunity that will open up doors to possibilities. Buenas noches, everybody. Have a great evening. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Liz. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Liz. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Good luck, everybody.